Meditation is a type of karma, skillful karma. Of course, the more skillfully you do it, the more skillful it's going to be. It can either be the kind of karma that leads to a good rebirth or simply to good karma that you will experience in this lifetime. Or it can be the kind of karma, as the Buddha said, that leads to the end of karma. In other words, it takes you to the deathless, depending how it's done, depending on what other factors of the path you combine it with. And it's useful to look at it from the point of view as a type of karma, because the Buddha provides lots of different ways of analyzing karma, both in the Dharma and in the Vinaya. And they can provide useful checklists for one that's not going right. You can ask yourself, well, what's, what's missing? What aspect is going wrong? The Vinaya has an interesting way of analyzing actions that can be very usefully applied to the meditation especially when you're trying to figure out what's going wrong with your meditation. It's a system for deciding whether a particular action was harmful, and if it was, how seriously harmful it was, and whether the, the monk who committed the offense can actually be held responsible. Now, when you're meditating, you're not doing anything offensive or harmful. but the different factors that go into an action are all present, and they can all go awry. So it's good to have a checklist to ask yourself what's missing, what's going off track, and so you can bring things back onto track. The five factors for an offense are one, the intention, two, the object, three, the effort, the actual action you do four, the perception, and then five, the result. Now in the vineyard, for example, suppose you kill an animal but you didn't intend to, then it's not an offense. Or if you stepped on something perceiving it to be not an animal, but it turns out that it was an animal, again, it's not an offense. So that's the case where the perception made a difference. In the first case, the intention made a difference. But when you apply the, this system of analysis to the meditation, start first with the intention. Sometimes you're here because you really do want to get the mind to settle down, you want to be clear about it. Other times your intention is simply to have a nice restful hour, in which case the meditation is going to come out differently. As soon as you find a nice restful spot, you'll stay there either with some alertness, or if you really want to rest, you let go of the alertness. You go into delusion concentration. This is why the Ajahns always say at the very beginning of each meditation session, make sure that your intention is clear. We are not just to rest. The mind will rest, but it's resting for a purpose, and you want it to rest in a certain kind of way. In a way that's alert, because the resting is here, so you can get into some insight into what the mind is doing and where it's causing unnecessary suffering. So that's the intention you want to have in place. And then there's the object of your meditation. Generally it's the breath. As John Lee says, make the breath your home base. So you want to make sure that you really are with the breath. Now you may discover that the mind has other problems. Sometimes it's having problems with lust. So switch over to the 32 parts of the body. If you're having problems with ill will for somebody, okay, try to develop goodwill. In other words, try to choose an object that is right for the state of the mind that you're experiencing right now. But in general, it's the breath. That's home base. That's where you want to come back to. Then there's the effort. This means really paying attention to the breath. 
and trying to be on top of the mind when it begins to wander off. And be intent, on, really intent on what you're doing. Don't just go through the motions. If the breath gets mechanical, if your awareness gets mechanical, pretty quickly you're going to lose interest. So remind yourself you're here to really experience the breath as it goes through the body. In this case, the actions that the Buddha describes in the very beginning steps of breath meditation. Discern short breathing, discern long breathing. And from there you can discern other variations in the breath. And then be aware of the whole body as you breathe in, breathe out. That's an effort you have to do to maintain that sense of whole body awareness. And then you calm the fabrication of the body. In other words, you calm the way the breath has an impact on the body. These are things you choose to do. Always have it clearly in mind what you're going to be doing. Otherwise, you sit here and the mind wanders there a bit, wanders back, comes here, goes there, deals with the pain here, deals with something else there. In other words, it's kind of desultory. It doesn't have a clear notion of the steps that it has to go through. So remind yourself, there are steps. Try to be very clear about where you are in the steps. I was talking with someone last night. They were saying that he always had trouble figuring out when the meditation went well, what he had been doing leading up to the point where the mind was very still. That was because his attention was random. And just happened to hit the jackpot. It's when you're more methodical that you can remember, oh, I was doing this, 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 and then the mind settled down. And that's how the meditation becomes a skill. Because then you know the steps, you know what you're supposed to do. And there will be variations from one night to the next, but they're not infinite. You begin to get a sense of the range of what kind of states the mind gets into and what you need to do in order to corral them back to get everything settled down. That's the effort. Then there's the perception. What perception of the breath are you holding in mind? What perception of the mind are you holding in mind? Where are you, for example, in your body right now? It's best to hold in mind the perception that there's already awareness all the way, all the way through the body. In other words, there's an awareness of your foot in the foot, there's an awareness of your hand in the hand. Sometimes we have the perception that we're up in the head, looking at the rest of the body. And then we try to push that head awareness into everything else, and that gets everything all confused. Instead, have the perception that the awareness of the body is already full. Simply, it's a matter of allowing everything to come out and show itself. They don't want any one part of the body to block out other parts of the body. That's your perception of the mind. This issue also applies to when there's pain. You can ask yourself, which side of the pain are you on? Are you on the top or in the bottom? Are you both sides? Ideally, you should be on both sides of the pain. You can work with it more easily that way. Then, of course, there's the perception of the breath as an energy, not so much the air coming in and out through the nose, but an energy that suffuses the body, it goes down the nerves, goes down the blood vessels, suffuses through all the muscles of the body. And then when you're breathing in, it's not so much that you're trying to push energy or push the breath into a solid lump. You're simply allowing the energies to connect. So the energy of the breath comes in and suffuses and swells the other energies. And then when you breathe out, you don't have to squeeze things out. Allow everything to remain full even as you breathe out. This is how rapture can develop. If you squeeze everything out with the out-breath, well, how is it going to develop? How can there be any sense of fullness? 
to hold a perception of fullness as you breathe in and as you breathe out. The energy flowing in and out like the tides. And you find that the mind has a much easier time of settling down. Because that's the fifth factor, the results. How is it going? Are you getting what you wanted in the begin to begin with? In other words, are you getting the mind to settle down? And are you getting the quality of alertness that you wanted? So these, these are the five aspects of the meditation that you can use as kind of a checklist. What's your original intention? Make sure that the intention is to settle down and be clear. Develop a sense of stillness that is alert. Choose the object that's right for you right now. And be very clear on the fact that even though we are trying to get the mind into right concentration, you can have all kinds of thoughts about jhana, this level of jhana, that level of jhana. Don't make the jhana the object of your meditation. The object is going to be the breath. Or don't just sit there and make your hopes about what you want to be the object. Yet the object has to be, what is the sensation of the breath coming in and out of the body right now? Content yourself with being there, just with the sensation. And that moves into the effort. To be mindful, alert, ardent. Really making sure that you stay with that sensation. Hold the perception in mind that helps you there. And the results are going to be what you want. All these factors apply whether the object is going to be the breath or whatever object you're choosing for the evening. So it's a useful checklist. And it keeps reminding you that when you hit certain states in the meditation that seem very large and expansive, okay, this is the result of action. These things too are fabricated. Some people get into a state of what seems to be large awareness, and they think it's the unfabricated or the unconditioned. And they've totally forgotten, well, that they did something to create that. There was a perception that kept it going. There was an intention. They'd focused on an object. They'd put effort in. This is a result of all that. And if you can remember that, then it's very easy not to fall for the, these states. So keep remembering. Concentration is a kind of karma. It's a karma you want to develop as a skill, whether it's simply for the good results it's going to bring in this lifetime, and having a more steady mind, a more reliable mind, or thinking about results in the future lifetimes. Having developed these skills is going to be really good to be able to use them when you have to leave the body. Or if you would decide you want to go on beyond another round of rebirth, you want to try something more transcendent, well, the concentration is karma that leads you there, too. This is one of the reasons why the Buddha talks about karma. He doesn't give a complete theory about how everything happens in the world and can be traced back to a particular action. He teaches karma to the extent that it's useful in getting the mind to be trained so it puts an end to suffering. That's as far as it goes, but that's pretty far. Much better than having a map to everything, but still suffering. So use these teachings to take you where you want to go, because they can take you far. <laughs>